Week one is in the books in the first Trump criminal trial in Manhattan. This criminal case is for Donald Trump's falsification of business records to interfere with the 2016 election. We have all 12 jurors and six alternates who were selected and sworn in. Some hiccups along the way during jury selection. And by hiccups, I mean Donald Trump threatening and intimidating at least one of the jurors and making her uh, leave uh, after being sworn in. Uh, We'll break down everything that uh, went down in the courtroom. Uh, But it was eventful, but it moved rather expeditiously. And so um, opening statements will be taking place on Monday. Uh, On Friday, Donald Trump tried yet again to go to the appellate division to try to stop this trial. It's like, look, man, the jury's been selected. Everyone's been sworn in. What are you doing? Seems that Donald Trump is really suffering just sitting there. He's unable to sit there. His uh, legal team had to make him a picture book filled with uh, purported flattering headlines. And then Donald Trump sits there with a Sharpie And then he redacts portions from articles from right-wing media to make them more flattering to him. He's actually got someone by the name of Natalie Harp, who he's paid over $105,000 to follow him around with a portable printer to print out these articles that he likes to read. And then he goes out to the media afterwards and says, you see these headlines? You see these headlines? Look at what these headlines are saying. Also, um, you know, some other uh, uh, news that we broke here on the Midas Touch Network about what was going down in the courtroom, we may touch upon that. But there was other big news this week as well. Um, The New York Attorney General's office, they uh, filed a brief with Justice Ngoron in the civil fraud case calling out Donald Trump's uh, surety bond by Knight Specialty Insurance Company as being... Uh, not compliant with New York law, it's a nice way of of saying unlawful, Um, that they don't have the necessary cash reserves in order to uh, even function as a surety, and that there are other major red flags here uh, that should uh, disqualify Knight Specialty Insurance Company as a surety here. A hearing will take place on Monday. You heard that right. And there will be a hearing in a criminal case against Donald Trump for falsification of business records. That will take place Monday now that the jury's been sworn in. And then at right around the same time, there's going to be uh, oral argument and hearing on whether Donald Trump's bond in a civil fraud case where he was found liable for $464 million, whether the $175 million bond was a lawful or unlawful bond. We should talk as well about a big Supreme Court oral argument this week. The case was Fisher versus United States, and it deals with um, some of the main charges that insurrectionists were charged with by the Department of Justice, 18 U.S.C. Section 512 sub C for obstruction of an official proceeding. Michael Popak and I will break down what went down in that oral argument. And then finally, let's touch upon the fact that uh, Judge Eileen Cannon in the Southern District of Florida, she denied Donald Trump's uh, co-defendants, Waltine Nauta and Carlos de Oliveira's motion to dismiss the indictment in the Mar-a-Lago document case where Donald Trump stole national defense information, including nuclear secrets and war plans, and then claims because he put them in boxes and sent them to Mar-a-Lago, they're now his personal property. In other words, a pretty eventful week. I'm Ben Micellis, joined by Michael Popak. Popak, uh, jury has been selected, sworn in, opening statement on Monday. I think you owe Karen Friedman Agnifilo some lunch because you thought it was going to go a little bit into this week, but... um, What did you think about the process, how fast it's moving? Of course, Donald Trump's been complaining. He's he said that he's being railroaded by by the speed that this thing is taking place. What do you make of it all? 
Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, the speed, the velocity at which it's operating is about is about normal. Karen and I had a debate about whether it was going to get through week one with jury selection or it was going to roll over to Monday with opening statements on Tuesday, hence the lunch bet. But the velocity at which it's moving is consistent with constitutional principles of fairness and due process. Donald Trump is represented by able counsel in the room and Susan Necklace and Todd Blanche. Um, they have uh, uh, participated to the, uh, their vigorous abilities during the uh, attempt to take what, what started as a panel of almost 500 and got it down to uh, the 12 now sworn in, seats one through 12, and the six alternates who are the Donald Trump jury um, in moving forward. They um, they vigorously argued for four cause challenges to get rid of people without having to use their peremptory challenges. They used their 10 peremptory challenges, as did the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Um, they vigorously uh, vetted all of the potential jurors, some sometimes so vigorously that it led to jurors who were not were impaneled but not yet sworn uh, being dismissed because they feared intimidation and couldn't be fair and impartial. But they, they have uh, willingly um, and vigorously participated in a jury selection process on the Trump side. They found social media posts for people that they didn't think uh, made, made, made for an impartial or fair juror. They brought that to the judge's attention. There was voir dire. There was subsequent interviews led by the judge to try to get to the bottom of it. Um, and th this was done... Um, you know, as Karen had said, the first day or two was slow. <laughs> we lost a couple of jurors even after we thought we had selected them. But then once, and this always happens, once you lose your peremptory challenges or you exhaust them, you, you don't have a lot of moves left as a person selecting a jury. I've selected um, about 20 different juries in my career and I've been consultants for my colleagues in picking other juries. So I kind of get the process. And it's an elaborate game of Tetris or whatever you want to call it, because you know who's coming behind, but you want to get a particular juror jur in the box for you. So you have to judiciously use your uh, and then figure out if the other side is going to use their uh, challenge to try to get the person that you may want in the box. And the result is just what we thought it would be. I won't go into the details of each person, but it is, uh, as a New Yorker, I will tell you, it, it is a well-balanced uh, jury that has uh, now been sworn to be fair and impartial. They said they would be. I'm, there is a smattering of Republicans that are on that jury, and that's fine. There are a lot of Democrats, uh, liberal and or independence on there. I can just I just know from their background and their neighborhoods that it's more likely than not that they fit that particular bill. But there are Republicans on there. We've got two guys in financial services. We got two lawyers, one corporate, one litigator. We got seven men. We got five women. It's about as balanced as Donald Trump or anybody can expect. And his claim in the recent filing is now 11th attempt, 12th attempt, and fourth time in a week and a half that he'll he'll be rejected running running over to the appellate division which are the appellate court in Manhattan and asking for an emergency stay because he can't get a fair jury picked because they're all biased against Donald Trump well the entire four day process completely belies that argument uh he picked a fair and impartial jury the lawyers accepted that jury that jury has been sworn in and this this new filing is both a day late and lots of legal arguments short of being successful. There will be opening statement on Monday. Uh, we'll also hear from the judge on his ruling about which of the six or seven uncharged bad acts and crimes of Donald Trump will be used against him, allowed to be used against him in cross-examination if, if he takes the stand because the judge handled it in what we call a Sandoval hearing on Friday and told the parties he'll tell them on Monday before opening statement which of the topics will be able to be put in. It won't impact anybody's opening statement because that's not an opening statement item. On the on the um, who's going to be the first witness, 
It's anybody's guess. And the other side has forfeited the right, Trump side, to know who the first witness is going to be for the prosecution because the judge said, no, you're busy attacking witnesses in social media postings and, and other bad things. I'm not going to well, I'm not going to force the prosecutors to tell you which of their many witnesses they're going to put on first. We could you and I can kibitz here about which one we think it is or which ones we think it isn't. But the uh, bad news for Trump, they're just going to have to prepare, you know, pick out their top four that they think it is, and that will be witness number one. Because there will be a witness, um, likely. It depends on what happens Monday morning in terms of procedural posture uh, and procedural logistics that have to happen. But if they get to oral argument, a couple hours of peace, I mean, um, opening statement, a couple hours of peace, there should be the start of a witness on Monday. Maybe it rolls till Tuesday. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I think um, possibly in the afternoon on Monday, we'll have our first witness my thought is that the first witness is not going to, I could be wrong. You know, I don't think it's going to be a totally explosive first witness in the same way kind of E. Jean Carroll's case, you put on E. Jean Carroll first, you know, because this is a document case, you know, I think you find somebody who can kind of go through all of the checks, all of the accounts, and you establish, you know, right away kind of your prima facie case of, here are the uh, checks. Here are the payments that were made to Stormy Daniels. Um, here's how it, it came up on the ledger. Here's why it's false. And then I think you start moving into you know some of your more explosive witnesses: your Michael Cohen's, your Stormy Daniels, your David Pecker uh, from AMI. Um, Popak also next week. There's going to be. Uh, in addition to opening statements, uh, and, and we'll talk in the next segment about the New York Attorney General civil fraud um, hearing on the uh, surety, the surety bond that uh, seems to be invalid, and we think Justice Ngoron is going to reject that. Next week, Michael Popak, we also have a contempt hearing against Donald Trump for his threats and witness intimidations and violations of the gag order in this criminal case that's currently pending. Um, earlier in the week, the Manhattan District Attorney uh, right away uh, rolled out this contempt motion. The motion itself was you know, very ominously worded for Donald Trump about, you know, you can be arrested, you can be put in jail, you know, for this. And um, then as the week progressed, as Donald Trump made some additional statements saying that there were like liberal activists trying to be on the jury, that's a violation of subsection C of the gag order. Donald Trump reposted other statements about uh, Michael Cohen, I believe Stormy Daniels as well. So now there's a total of seven violations of the gag order that will be subject uh, to, that will be the subject of this contempt hearing. And uh, there was that final moment, and I want to get your take on it, Popak, about how you think Justice Mershon, the presiding judge, has been handling uh, these matters, um, where uh, Donald Trump got up to leave thinking the day was going to be over after the jury had left. And then Justice Mershon said, sir, sit down right now. I have not excused you. You understand? And Donald Trump like put his hands up sheepishly and was like, I get it. I get it. I get it. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down. And Justice Mershon was like, thank you. In any event, counsel, and then went on with his kind of usual business. It's actually been great to see Justice Mershon control the courtroom the way the way he is. I had always heard about Justice Mershon's reputation that he was no nonsense. So it's it's good to it's good to see that. And then Justice Mershon said, "I'll see you next week." You know, at the contempt hearing. Um, so what what do you make of that? I, I think he's going to be found in contempt. Oh yeah. I think it will be a first tier violation. I do think, though, I, and I truly think this, it's not just like, oh, you know, justice, you, you know, you're, you're going to spread that Popokian hopium, you smoke that Popokian opium. I really think that Mershon will throw Trump in jail if he does it after getting, like he'll get sanctioned at this hearing. And I think Mershon's the kind of judge who will throw Trump in jail. There's a cell, as Karen Friedman Agnifilo described it, like kind of right down the hallway. And I think that Trump will be placed in that holding cell if he violates it after the first monetary sanction he's going to get. What do you think, Popak? 
Well, a couple of things. Um, as to the first witness, I'm not sure that they bore the jury on the prosecution with the Czech person. Um, I think my, if I were trying this case, I'd have, I wouldn't put in Michael Cohen. I mean, you don't lead with Michael Cohen, but you may want to lead with somebody with a little more substance to be a little bit more of a roadmap witness. I don't know if that's David Pecker or if that's somebody else. It's not Hope Hicks. I just think it's not going to be the records custodian type, which will lead to glassy eyed after, you know, what will be explosive opening statements to then numb the jury to death with the first witness. But we'll see. Prosecutors, you know, are conservative cats and I'm more of a swing for the fences type trial lawyer anyway. So we'll see what happens on that. You're right about a busy trial week and and, and hearing week for Donald Trump. 22nd, he's got that hearing, New York Attorney General bond case, where I agree with you when we get to the segment. I think his bond is in jeopardy, meaning collection efforts against him can start. Contempt on the 23rd. 24th, Judge Meta down in the District of Columbia has ordered the lawyers to, because uh, he's letting their civil, the civil fraud case brought by the Metropolitan Capitol Police to move forward. They have to make a major filing in that case. And on the 25th, we've got oral argument uh, for the Supreme Court. This is must watch podcasting and YouTubing on the Midas Dutch Network. Um, our network may explode next week based on everything that we have to fo- everything we have to follow. As to the um, Judge Mershon being in charge. We've been consistently predicting that it was going to be an entire new world and universe for Donald Trump and that everything that he had tried to get away with in civil court when there's been no jury was not going to work for him. What we meant by that is that he would be in jeopardy of criminal contempt, being uh, sanctioned, admonished frequently by the judge. And you and I, and I certainly reported on it in hot takes in the past, there, the Manhattan DA went into the room and watched Donald Trump in action during the second E. Jean Carroll case. The Manhattan DA went into the room, in the back of the room, and watched Donald Trump in action during the uh, civil fraud 13-week trial, including when Donald Trump tried to testify and all of that. So when they wrote about some of this stuff, it's some of it's from experience. The reason they did that is they wanted to learn and to be ready for Donald Trump in the criminal case, because they didn't think, and neither do you and I, Ben, did we think that Donald Trump was going to start suddenly grow a brain and grow decorum and grow restraint, and he was going to act differently in the criminal cases than he had acted in the civil cases. They believed, rightly so, that he was going to act out the same way, and they wanted to be ready and prepared for it. And Mershon, too, is no dummy. He's been sitting in New York reading the paper in the media. He knows what happened. He knows how many times Judge Kaplan in the E. Jean Carroll case had to admonish Donald Trump, the arguments that he got into with Donald Trump in ways that we were almost aghast that that was happening in the civil cases. We know how disrespectful and um, uh, and, uh, and uh, how much acting out he did for 13 weeks in the Judge Angoron uh, presided over civil fraud case with no jury, just the bench attacking the law clerk, attacking Judge Angoron, attacking his wife, attacking, attacking, attacking. And that was without a jury. And we always said, oh, wait till he gets, if he thinks this is the playbook for Trump that's going to work in, in with Judge Mershon, he is in for a rude awakening. Some of the reporting out there is that, uh, because as much as I criticize some of his lawyers, like Todd Blanche, Todd Blanche had had, operative word, a good reputation when he was a prosecutor for 13 years in the U.S. Attorney's Office, where he was the head of the criminal division at one point. Um, It's now in tatters, as far as I'm concerned, by the way he's operating currently. But Blanche, according to people that know him, is aghast that Donald Trump is already running afoul of Judge Mershon, that he is um, using ridiculous facial expressions expressions, and acting out in front of the what was then the jury to be selected or in front of the jury. And um, all of these things, as, as I said, as I joked with, with Karen during midweek, when that video of Trump with Blanche next to him behind the bike rack when he gives that press conference is priceless because Blanche looks like, you know, he's, you could saw, you could amputate his leg without anesthesia. I mean, that's, he just is, he's just not present. And Susan Necklace is like seven rows back, the other lawyer, and she's just holding her clipboard acting like I'm not the lawyer for Donald Trump. So they, they've got a big problem with Donald Trump. 
Rashawn has to do exactly what he has said. He's already invited the Manhattan DA to file a motion for sanctions for bad faith filing in this case. You and I reported on it last week. It was buried in one of Rashawn's orders, which was, you didn't ask me for this now, but there is bad faith filing in this case. And you are welcome to seek a remedy related to it. That has to do with the filings that have been made in the case. Then you had the gag order violation and, and enough is enough. And I, I think that the Judge Rashawn was very smart and canny to push it off to the 23rd, not necessarily because he needed full briefing. I think he's giving Donald Trump another entire weekend weekend to violate. You said it's seven. I think it'll be up to 12 or more. There's a whole weekend to go before they get to the 23rd. Um, and nothing stops Donald Trump, not facing a jury on Monday morning, not opening statements, not the chance of him being convicted of a class C felony, not up to 20 years in prison. Nothing changes his approach that he's going to pressure and pressurize all of our institutions, including the New York criminal justice system. So Mershon telling him to sit the F down, my paraphrase, uh, which is not the first time he's told him to do that, that letting him know that there is there's only two... Yes, the criminal defendant has rights. <laughs> Two most important participants in the criminal justice system, as far as I'm concerned, is the jury for whom you stand. There's a reason you stand for them out of respect. And the judge who sits on high on a bench. Criminal defendant, yes, presumed innocent and all of that, um, and does have a fair and impartial jury. But they are not the most important people in that room, and, and certainly not the Trump versus the judge. The least important person is Donald Trump. And if he didn't do that, then like you said in the past, you give him a, you give Donald Trump a, a finger, he takes your life or whatever you say. You know, you have to start laying down bright lines uh, and and uh, draw lines in the sand or Donald Trump will take full advantage of it. I believe, I agree with you. I think it's going to be progressive discipline. I think he's going, he's already told, this is the second warning. He's already told, Mershon's already told Trump about two weeks ago, reminding him that if you violate the gag order, let me remind you of my two inherent authorities. One is criminal contempt, and the other is fines and jail. And they are on the table. He told them that in writing two weeks ago. He will remind him of that when he issues his order in which he finds him and or threatens him with jail again. I think it starts with I think he can he can go up to five thousand. I think the Manhattan DA has asked for a thousand a day. I think I think he'll go higher than the thousand a day that's been requested. And I think he will tell him if you violate this again, depending upon the nature of the violation and the impact on this case, because that's all I'm concerned about is providing a, an appropriate criminal justice process. You are you. I will find you in criminal contempt, and you will go to jail. I don't know if it's the temporary holding cell in the back of the courthouse, or it's like take him to Rikers. For, you know, which is going to be apoplectic and apocalyptic if it happens because you got the security detail, the Secret Service, the candidate for president, the this and the that. I mean, I almost don't want to send him to prison, to be honest with you, because it'll just make him um, more of a martyr than he already is. But I also want justice done. So I'm sort of on the fence related to whether you should actually put him in Rikers Island. Yeah. You know, I think you throw him in prison. Um, I think that the whole martyr thing becomes its own kind of narrative that should be met with uh, the strong arm of law and order to say, you're not a martyr, you're a criminal, you're a crook, you're a fraud, you're a loser. And the same way Justice Mershon is controlling that courtroom, you know, I think that we as a country that values law and order, and of course the Republican Party, you know, we, we, we've been so comfortable and we've been so weak to and allowed Donald Trump, this petulant, whiny loser, to go out there and just whine, oh, they're coming after me, they're coming after me. You know, we're the United States of America and it's time to stand up to these bullies, to these losers, to these wannabe fascists, to these criminals, and let them know what law and order is really about. I want to talk a little bit more about the trial, um, and then I want to talk about what's going on with uh, this bond issue where Donald Trump um, was given a break by the appellate division. This goes to my point, and then Donald Trump takes the break that he was given, and as I said, you give him an inch, he takes your life. And he will screw you every single time. We'll talk about that and more. Let's take our first quick break of the show. Well, have you heard about NAD Plus? It's one of the most important molecules in the human body to age well. NAD Plus helps promote cellular energy, 
maintain healthy DNA, detect nutrients efficiently, supports detoxification, and supports your cellular health. Simply put, keeping your NAD plus levels high is vital to helping the body feel youthful. But did you know NAD plus levels plummet with age? So by age 50, most people's NAD plus levels are only half of what they were at age 20. Luckily, science has discovered a way to boost your NAD plus levels up to 50%, and it's called Qualia NAD plus, a groundbreaking supplement from Neurohacker Collective. The reason so many health experts are partnering with Neurohacker and the reason I'm proud to have them sponsor this podcast is you're simply not going to find more carefully researched, life-changing nutritional formulas, especially for aging well. Qualia NAD Plus is a supplement that includes ingredients called NAD Plus precursors that your body can convert into NAD Plus to boost your NAD Plus levels up to 50%. And Qualia NAD Plus has many other holistic ingredients that support all other major aspects of NAD Plus production in your body. Look, I want to feel 30 when I'm 58. That's why I'm staying at the cutting edge of aging research and boosting my NAD plus levels. And Qualia NAD plus is a huge part of how well I age and putting it in my control. After just a month on Qualia NAD plus, I'm feeling energy support and vitality return that I haven't felt in years. This stuff's amazing. I feel like I did 15 years ago. To boost your NAD plus levels up to 50%, go to neurohacker.com slash Truth, T-R-U-T-H, for up to 50% off and use code TRUTH at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's neurohacker.com slash truth for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Neurohacker for sponsoring today's episode. What if you could support small family farmers and reduce your environmental imprint all while enjoying the highest quality meat on earth? When you join the monk movement, you can. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did. And as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should. Because the family farm does it better, and the Moink difference is a difference you can taste. Unlike the supermarket, Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You choose the meat delivered in every box like ribeyes, to chicken breasts, to pork chops, to salmon fillets, and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. Moink is helping save rural America. I love it, and you will too. Join the Moink movement today. Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted. And Ring Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff, he jumped at the chance to invest in Moink. Plus, they guarantee you'll say, oink, oink, I'm just so happy I got moinked. I know I do, and you will too. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash Legal AF right now, and listeners of this show get free bacon for a year. That's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash legal AF. That's moinkbox dot com slash legal AF. I want to give a special thanks to those pro democracy sponsors right there. The discount codes are in the description below. And I want to thank everybody as well for making the Midas Touch Network and Legal AF the most watched destination on digital for all Trump trial coverage. I think we have some of the best sources here, everybody from Michael Popak, who practices in that courtroom. You have Karen Friedman Agnifilo, who was the previous acting district attorney in Manhattan and the number two at the district attorney's office. She has more than uh, close to 30 years experience at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. You don't get much more experience covering a prosecution by that office than with Karen Friedman Agnifilo and Michael Popak. Oh, wait, you do. We also have Michael Cohen as a <laughs> correspondent who is actually a witness in this case. So in terms of the lineup, in terms of getting firsthand information or as close to the information as you can get, I would put Legal AF and the Midas Touch Network up there. And it's important for us 
to make sure that we don't speculate, that we do work our sources. And so I don't want to belabor the point here because, look, I didn't intend for that video, Popak, that I did where I was talking about how a source in the courtroom or sources had said that Donald Trump was passing gas in the courtroom and it was vile and it was disgusting to his lawyers. I, I, I didn't think that that was it was actually buried on eight minutes or or at the end of a video that I you know that I did. I do a lot of hot takes in a day. It's not like I was like, I'm going to do the fart hot take today. It was something that I heard amongst thousands of other data points that I got. And, you know, ASIN, who works for us, thought that that clip was an interesting, you know, was an interesting clip and a data point. And he posted it, but he posts a lot of other clips. There's numerous other interviews that I did that day, you know, and it's interesting that that, that one went viral the way it did. And, you know, you, you as I said on the video, you can take what you want. I mean, we know people who are there. And as I said, people could be saying that because they know, oh, Midas Touch, you know, would, you know, would be interested in that type of data. I don't know. But, you know, it's from credible people. And I said, t take it for what it's worth. And, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely been a lot of discussion about it. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, we've been making these handy scorecards every single day. I, I don't want to spend so much time on it, but I want to put them up here very quickly. So if you wanted to take screenshots to remind yourself of just what happened every day, every day we do a scorecard like this. So Trump trial day one, Trump did a motion to recuse the judge that was denied. Evidence of the Trump catch and kill scheme where he tried to pay off people first by using AMI and then misclassifying them or falsifying business records as legal fees. All that information's coming in. The Trump subpoena backfires to the DOJ, and there were some text message and emails that were bad from Donald Trump that actually turned up in that batch of discovery. The Manhattan District Attorney filed the contempt motion. The judge set the contempt motion hearing. Trump was falling asleep. Trump did not submit his exhibit books on time, so the judge ordered that it be turned over in 24 hours. The jurors arrived. Trump was falling asleep again. 50 of the initial batch of 96 jurors said they couldn't be fair. The voir dire continued. Then we have Trump trial day two. Trump trial day two. Trump blamed his accountant and lawyers for the fraud he committed when he walked in. Trump waives his right to um, uh, participate at the sidebar, which he was previously making, just trying to make everyone's life more difficult because he had a right to be at sidebars with the judge and then everybody waves it. And then so he realized, wait a minute, I'm going to have to stand up. I don't want to stand up. So he waved that. The voir dire removes. Trump fell asleep again. Trump scowled at a juror and then Justice Mershon said, stop that. If you do that again, there's going to be big issues. The judge admonished Trump. The first six jurors were sworn in with more voir dire. Wednesday, the court went dark. There was no trial. Then we went to day three on Thursday. The jurors arrived. Juror number two, who was sworn in, was excused because she felt intimidated after her identity may have been leaked. And Fox did a whole segment on juror number two before that. There were seven new Trump, or there was additional violations added to the contempt motion for a total of seven. Um, juror number four was excused. The previously sworn in juror four was excused for not disclosing an arrest. Then there was voir dire to 96 new jurors. The jurors reflected that they could be fair and impartial, but were not fans of Donald Trump, his policies, or his behavior. Many of them did. Some of them said they didn't have an opinion one way or another. 12 jurors were selected with one alternate. Then that brought us to Trump trial day four. And then in Trump trial day four, the jury was selected and sworn in. Trump was sleeping, possibly farting. There was a Sandoval hearing. Trump's lawyers complained that they don't know the DA witnesses. The DA was not going to disclose the witnesses which they don't legally have to do, but they normally do. They're not going to do it because of Trump's behavior. Justice Mershon lays down the law and takes control of the courtroom and lets Donald Trump know his behavior is unacceptable and to sit down. Opening statements are on Monday. And then there was the appellate division rejecting one of Donald Trump's stay attempts on Friday. And then Donald Trump filed another uh, application to try to get trial denied as well. So if you just want to take screenshots of all of that, what would, what would be interesting, Popak, we were hearing earlier today as well, that Trump's team has been in talks with Michael Avenatti to try to have Avenatti testify against his client 
Stormy Daniels and and testify at the at the trial. Um, you know, we'll see. But I think there's going to be a lot of um, shenanigans. We'll say that are um, you know that that will be um, you know that will be happening. So I wanted to flag that because that was news from earlier in the day. Popak, before we talk about the issues with the bond, anything else you just wanted to mention to our viewers about the Manhattan case, or should we go on to the bond? I'll just spend I'll just spend a minute. The the Manhattan DA feels so confidently about their case that one of their lead witnesses they they don't even need. They've told Alan Weisselberg, who under normal circumstances would be an important link in the chain of the conspiracy because of his interaction with Michael Cohen, with the campaign, with Donald Trump as the main money man in the Trump organization, which is the heart of this business record fraud election interference case and the pat and the money flow following the money from the Trump organization, um, Michael Cohen first to Stormy Daniels, Stormy Dan and then the reimbursement to Michael Cohen through the Trump organization and the books and records entries all as part of the election interference to tamp down these other sexual misconduct stories at a time when Donald Trump's side was up in arms about and worried about the impact on his electoral chances because of the Access Hollywood tape, which is going to be discussed with the jury, especially in opening, but not played for them. But they're so confident after cutting the deal in a plea bargain for for the second criminal conviction of Alan Weisselberg that they were like, no, you're you're good. Stay at Rikers Island. We don't need you. That shows for me a lot of bravado and the strength of the case. Uh, they don't even think they need him, so they cut a deal in the plea deal that they wouldn't they wouldn't call Alan Weisselberg. And and setting aside Michael Cohen for a minute, which everybody's all is because Trump has focused our attention on Michael Cohen. I don't even see Michael Cohen as the lead witness in this particular case. They have so much other evidence, um, including other people within the Trump organization that we will come to know and love during the course of this next six weeks of trial, some of which Donald Trump may not even remember the name of because he's had trouble with lower level executives, even with vice president titles in his organization. He has trouble remembering who they are. We've seen that in deposition testimony. And so they'll come up and just talk about it from what they were instructed to do, what they what they entered on the books and records, how Michael Cohen was paid, the legal services that he didn't provide, well before Michael Cohen even takes the stand. There's audio recordings that Michael Cohen surreptitiously took of Donald Trump that'll be coming into evidence that will prove the conspiracy involving and led by Donald Trump. There's Hope Hicks, who's coming in, that was his campaign director and a friend of Donald Trump. She testified at the Jan 6 committee. She's going to talk about because she's forced to under oath the campaign's reaction to the Access Hollywood tape and her involvement with the payoff of Stormy Daniels. There's so much of that that this other sideshow circus stuff, like we're going to bring Michael Avenatti out of prison where he is serving a sentence while he's he's been convicted twice in two different courthouses, two different systems for different crimes, you know, to bring in this felon who's lied and got convicted of things like fraud and forgery against Stor against Stormy Daniels to undermine Stormy Daniels. I mean, that I don't think that actually happens, although it's making for interesting talking points right now on this podcast. But um, putting that all of a side, some people might be thinking, well, how how Ben just described whatever and Popak just described the, the, the future. How is this going to be six or eight weeks? Because these some of these witnesses are going to take an extensive period of time to put on, even though... The, the, the event was relatively concise and discreet that Donald Trump is being charged with. It's not that complicated. This is not like some master criminal class on how to commit a crime. This isn't Ocean's Eleven, all right? This is, I don't know what this is, but this is really simple. But there are going to be a, a couple of dozen witnesses that are going to have to take the stand. And I, I feel going in, if I were picking a side and I've been on the defense side my whole career in this kind of context, I'd want to be on the prosecution side, not the defense side, even with the jury that's been selected and all of that. Um, just by what I know and you know from the 
evidence that's out there that is going to be brought into that courtroom. We can kibitz about it all we want on hot takes and on podcasts and whatever, but when it cha- it's different when a jury is sworn in the box, yep. those those wooden doors swing open and witnesses start being sworn in to rapt attention by a jury that is every day bonding and becoming a collective for their decision making. It is different than all of this other social media uh, stuff. Life sometimes intrudes. We had a horrific event out in front of the courthouse yesterday with somebody setting them, killing themselves by setting themselves on fire. He was obviously mentally deranged. It, had, it wasn't connected directly to the trial, but it, for a moment, it cast a pall over the court. And it shows you that life and every, all the planning, can uh, something else can intervene. Witness, I'll leave it on this. And you, you've had this experience, I'm sure, too. I've had witnesses that I thought were going to be amazing and they were going to be the highlight of the trial who crapped out, who like, you know, you know what the bed, continuing our theme today, on the uh, others that I thought they're they're going to be white knuckle events. Oh boy, this is the witness I've dreaded for the entire time I've had this case. And they turned out fine or they did great. They did much better than I thought they were going to do and the jury loved them. And that is the fog of war or trial that happens. Doesn't matter. All the best planning can't account for what happens in that courtroom. You know, some hit home runs, some hit singles, some strike out in front of a jury. We'll have to see. But that's why hopefully people are here on Legal AF and following what you, you Karen, and I are doing. You know, I can't help but point out the irony would be one word for it. We're Donald Trump in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case would say, if I had a jury, I was going to win. I don't get a jury. It's unfair. Then you and I had the debates whether was it really that Alina Haba failed to check a box? Is that specific civil claim a non-jury injunctive equitable relief claim not entitled Trump to a jury? But Trump would always argue, this is unfair. I don't have a jury. Now, Donald Trump has a jury and says, this jury is unfair. I'm being steamrolled right now. I need, I don't want this jury. The jury hates me. They're liberal activists. And so no I thought matter everybody, what it is. You know, wait, wait, on your point, you've raised it before. I thought he was so beloved in Manhattan, he could pull out a gun on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and get away with it. What happened to that Donald Trump? Well, that's the Donald Trump that the media loves to further those narratives versus look at the reality. It was one day during trial this week where Donald Trump said, I'm going to a bodega. I'm going to go to a bodega. And then the media followed him there. The media didn't question that the people who were lined up in that group were astroturfed from the New York Young Republicans Club, Saddam Hussein style, and in unison, the New York Young Republicans. That's the group that Donald Trump spoke at and said that the most courageous thing he did in his life was call sexually assaulting women locker room talk. Yeah, that group of people went to Harlem and they stood there and started chanting Donald Trump's name. And then the media wrote about it like this is Saddam Hussein stuff. This is Kim Jong-un stuff. This is Gaddafi stuff. And it's like just the media. Look at the photo of the New York Young Republicans. Then look at that crowd and you go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's that people who are doing. Maybe it's those people who are doing. He he did that two weeks ago at Chick-fil-A also. It was like, look, African-American woman must love Donald Trump because Trump went to a Chick-fil-A and one African-American woman hugged him. And it's like she's a Republican consultant. Go look. She works for Charlie Kirk, who says that black people shouldn't be pilots and that MLK Day should be eliminated. Well, the khakis and polo shirts should have been the tip off of the bodega in Spanish Harlem that he went to uh, for the young Republicans. That's one. Secondly, (laughs) he, he went there for a reason and he was supposed to meet the guy who worked in the bodega that pulled out a a gun as self-protection and killed somebody that was trying to rob him. That guy wasn't even there. That guy was in Puerto Rico on holiday. And and the other um, cynical side of this, I know you always accuse me of hopium. I don't know how I got that reputation. People that know me are like, how does Ben even call you that? Is that, do they know you? Um, But I like the cheery optimism sometimes. The, The thing that Karen pointed out with me on the midweek was, um, the other reason that uh, Harlem was chosen wasn't just for him to be law and order that day is because he figured out that a lot of the jury pool 
was coming from Upper Manhattan, which is what we call Harlem. Um, in fact, one of the uh, one of the jurors um, is from Harlem. Um, there's a few from the Upper East Side. There's for those who know New York, you know, I feel like I'm doing the New Yorker magazine cover. Uh, you know, Murray Hill, where my office is, yay, this is represented. But uh, they were pulling from the day that he went up there was a the day that a woman from Harlem was chosen to put on the jury. And I'm sure he went, oh, this is a good twofer. And then while he was there, he bashed Alvin Bragg, which is back to your point that he's committing some sort of campaign uh, violation by, you know, bashing Alvin Bragg as part of his campaign to get a write-off while he's up there at a bodega. It's all disgusting and on full display for week one of trial. You know, in talking about the New York Attorney General civil fraud case where Trump was whining that he wanted a jury, it's a good transition to talk briefly about this bond issue. I say briefly because there's going to be a hearing on Monday, and then we will see how justice in Goran ultimately rules. But to remind everybody, a, a civil judgment was entered against Donald Trump a few months back by Justice Ngoron in the amount of $464 million for Donald Trump's systemic and persistent fraud and inflation, uh, inflating his valuations of various properties fraudulently. It was a 90 plus page order. Donald Trump had a certain amount of days if he wanted to file an appeal and stay the enforcement of the uh, and stay the enforcement of the judgment pending the appeal he would have to post a bond that's not unique to donald trump it's not a criminal case that's a civil case meaning donald trump lost a monetary judgment and if he wants to avail himself of the privilege of staying the enforcement where the prevailing party, in this case, the New York Attorney General's office, can get their money now because they're the winning side. If you want to stop that or pause that justice from being served while you appeal, the law for everybody is you have to post that bond that's pretty much equal to the judgment amount. Well, Trump waits until the last minute, files an emergency appeal with the appellate division in New York. And the appellate division in New York, they don't reduce the judgment amount. Trump still owes a $464 million judgment that has compounding interest. But they reduce the bond obligation so it's not equal to 464. They basically picked an arbitrary number of $175 million and they gave Donald Trump 10 extra days. So they gave Donald Trump a discount on the bond and he's supposed to be this billionaire, but he claimed basically like he's indigent or he claimed he couldn't sell the assets. They, they gave him a break and then they gave him 10 days. And this is what I say. You give him an inch, he screws you every time. He's a perennial con artist. So what does he do? He doesn't go to a normal surety bond company. Look, to his credit, in the E. Jean Carroll case, he went to Chubb Insurance, which does business under a surety bond as federal insurance company. They're a real company. They have real assets. They do this. This is what they do and like it or don't like it, that's the business, one of the business lines that they're in. So there was nothing wrong with that surety bond. And that's where, you know, you and I, Popak, we could be critical about whether they should or shouldn't have been a surety, but we, we reported it. We're calling balls and strikes. Knight Specialty Insurance Company, I had never even heard of it before. You look up on their website, it doesn't even seem they have the assets to be a surety. It doesn't seem like they've ever even done this before. And sure enough, they don't have the assets. And it turns out, and the New York Attorney General's office called them out, and then they issued a response earlier in the week, Knight Specialty Insurance Company, and then the AG issued a response on Friday saying, you only have $135 million in surplus funds to be a surety. You claim you have $500 million in assets, but those aren't liquid. You're only $135 million liquid. The bond is $175. Your liquidity is underneath the bond. And then you want to take a look at what they're claiming that they're holding as collateral. And the collateral that's held by the surety doesn't actually provide them control over Donald Trump's assets. Trump still has control over this Schwab account. Trump, under the surety arrangement, has two days where he could basically move his money out um, from this money market account that has cash or cash equivalents. Um, he, he could move the money out if he wants to. And so the AG says, 
This is not a surety. I don't even know what this ar- – this is like a phony arrangement. This is not okay. And so there's a big hearing now on Monday about the validity of this surety bond. And the New York Attorney General is telling Justice and Goran, stop it. Do not allow this to happen. And Justice and Goran, I think, is going to say, yeah, I'm not for this. I don't know what the appellate division was thinking. I think Justice and Goran is not okay with this. Popak, I want to get your take on all of this. And I want to first, though, remind all of our legal AFers about the Patreon community, Popak, is absolutely popping. It's patreon.com slash legal AF. We have close to 2,100 students already. 2,100 students. We've been doing this for, what, under 30 days already. Um, and if you ever wanted to be in a law class taught by Professor Popak or Professor Mycellus, and you want to get into the weeds on some of these issues, let's try to get to at least 2,200 today. Let's try to grow this. To, I think we can hit 2,500, maybe even 3,000. A class of 3,000 would be pretty cool. That'd be bigger, double the size of my high school. And so if you want to take some you get really in the weeds with Professor Popak and Professor Mycellus. Um, I hate referring to myself in the third person or me. Go to patreon.com slash legal AF, dot com slash legal AF. I told you, Popak, I was a little worried at first that we were going to get so geeky on there that people were going to be like, all right, guys, this is a little bit too geeky for me. But the geeky seems to be the attraction of it. Patreon.com slash legal AF. By the way, one thing on that, we're doing that. We're doing the tutorials, the teachable moments. We're doing the, what I call the TED Talk meets a law school class. But we're also doing, um, depending upon the level, there are levels here, depending upon the level, you also get early access to hot takes before they even go up on the network. And so that's also, I think, been driving some people to uh, check us out for free, but then end up in one of our three tiered memberships. Popak, when we get back, it's a lightning round. I want to get your take on the surety bond issue, what you think Justice Ngoron's going to do. I want to talk about the Supreme Court oral argument in the Fisher case. And then finally, we'll touch briefly upon uh, Judge Eileen Cannon uh, delivering some bad news for Donald Trump's co-defendants for a change. We'll be right back after our last quick break. Oh, we've talked about sustainable products here before, and I've been making a concerted effort to try With a newborn on the way, I only use products that are toxin-free, all-natural, and better for the environment. Generally, I would say that it's most important to make these swaps in the kitchen. That's where so many of the products that we use can be wrapped in plastics. And it's especially important to use all-natural products when we're cleaning around our food. That's why I've been so excited to make the switch to Reel's new bamboo paper towel. Just like all of Reels products, the paper towels are free of inks, dyes, and BPAs are 100% tree-free, and all packaging is plastic-free, even down to the tape on the box. For too long, the sustainable options for paper towels were a poor substitute. They were usually flimsy, unabsorbent, and felt like the cheap paper towels you might find in a public restroom. Reels new bamboo paper towels are the first truly premium sustainable paper towels and are up to 50% thicker and more absorbent than the leading sustainable brand. The sheets are two-ply for extra absorbency and thanks to the strength of bamboo, they can hold up to the toughest messes. And while the other conventional tree-based options are wrapped in plastic in the grocery aisle, Real Paper's packaging is plastic-free, compostable, and offers free shipping on all orders. When I use Real, it doesn't feel like I'm sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade from the paper towels I traditionally use. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash legalaf and sign up for a subscription using my code legalaf at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash legalaf or enter promo code legalaf to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. So let's give Reels tree-free paper a try. Real is paper for the planet. Here's something we all know. Cheap razors are annoying. They cut you. They irritate you. And heck, they frustrate you. And don't get me started with subscription razor services. Can you say, blah? That's why you got to meet 
Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the International Space Station and Mars Rover. And now they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. If you're like 88% of men who experience irritation from shaving like me around my beard, you might be expecting the worst with each shave. Yet Henson users like me have seen dramatic improvements including the disappearance of ingrown hairs and razor bumps. Henson Shaving's innovation comes from an interesting analogy. Think of razor blades as diving boards. The longer the board, the more it wobbles. The micro wobbles are what lead to more nicks and cuts. Henson solves this by minimizing blade extension, addressing the root cause of bad shaves, not the blade itself, but the extension. Henson's aerospace background has enabled the creation of razors with unmatched precision. Using aerospace-grade CNC machines, they achieve a blade extension of just 0.0013 inches, less than a human hair's thickness. This incredibly precise control over the blade's position ensures a vibration-free and incredibly close shave. The Henson razor works with standard dual-edge blades to give you that old-school shave with the benefits of new-school tech. Once you own a Henson razor, it's only about $3 to $5 per year to replace the blades. My first shave to clean up around my beard with a Henson razor was incredibly refreshing. The design is sleek and the durability is exactly what you want. And the affordability factor, you simply can't beat it. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that'll last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash LegalAF to pick the razor for you and use code LegalAF and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash legal AF and use code legal AF. Michael Popak, those ad reads that you do, <laughs> I already have the products and I want to buy them again. I mean, you're so good with them. The, disc- the discount codes <laughs> are in the descriptions below. Really, thank you to our pro-democracy sponsors because you know we don't have outside investors at the network or on the show. So you and I try to find fun and interesting ways to grow this network. We bring on more editors. We bring on more people. You see the stories that we're breaking on the editorial side. And you know we've had a brick-by-brick brick approach to our growth. We have not taken an outside investor money. It allows us to stay independent. Um, and one of the ways we build that is through patreon.com slash legal AF. Another way we build that is through those pro democracy sponsors. Another way is through the uh, memberships here on the YouTube. And I know that you all love the new Justice Mershon emoji. And so I don't really think if you were to ask other networks is, uh, Funding your network with Justice Mershon emojis, the smartest business plan. I'm not sure they would tell you yes, but that's the power of the community right here. Popak, where we last left off, we were talking about the bond. Let me get your take on Trump's uh, putting forward this seemingly invalid surety bond, the hearing on Monday. What do you think goes down? Yeah, I think you covered it. Um, I think you covered it really well. Um, and we will cover the Monday hearing. We all have our own versions of connections in there. I just emailed one of mine um, who dutifully went to almost every day of the 13-week civil fraud trial itself. And I'm I'm trying to figure out whether she's going to be able to get into the bond hearing and give us some really good reporting on that. Either way, we will report on it on our, our best knowledge. I think Judge Ngoron has had enough of um, breaks that Donald Trump has taken for himself when they weren't uh, he wasn't entitled to it. He basically lied to the appellate. Let's call it for what it is. We don't blow smoke or sunshine. He lied to the appellate division. His lawyers did when he said that he couldn't find, he looked everywhere and he couldn't find the $465 million bonding company. It was a lie because Don Henke, who can't keep his mouth shut. I've never seen him. I, I know more about this surety and I've been doing this a long time than I ever thought I would or that I need to know about Don Hankey, his companies, uh, you know, the king of the subprime auto loan, who also who also has decided that he loves his 15 minutes of fame, maybe more than Donald Trump, and keeps talking. And so uh, we learned a lot about him. And we also learned that he was willing to give the $465 million bond on his own say-so to Donald Trump. See, Donald Trump had to go to like a family office bonding company, not a like a legitimate 
publicly traded bonding company like Chubb that ta- that has actual investors and an actual due diligence and a board of directors. He had to go to a, like a guy, like a guy he shoots pool with or whatever it is, an eight million dollar uh, donor donor to the Trump campaign in, in Don Hankey. And when, but the problem is, I don't know if he's never posted a bond of this. So that's a lie. And the appellate div- to my point, and the appellate division said, "Oh, you can't find a bond." Oh, that's a- okay, we'll lower it to 175 million. That's enough. And even 175 million, where he allegedly has cash in order to do this, we know he's got that Schwab account. He could have just posted or pledged the undertaking of the Schwab account without even having a bonding company in the middle and paying some sort of lower fee. A fee that Don Hankey said he didn't charge Donald Trump enough because of all the aggravation he's now going through having to defend this bond in the court on Monday. You know, these are these are friends that you that you need in your life, like Don Hankey. So um, the, having gone to the appellate division and got a tremendous haircut on the amount of the undertaking that had to be posted. He then played with fire again. Like he plays with, you know, one hand has glycerin, nitroglycerin and the other one has like gunpowder. And this is Donald Trump every day running around. Think of that image. And he's like, well, let's, let's F with the bond. <laughs> Why not? Even though I got a break that no other person would get, I'm going to F with it. I'm going to go to a bonding company that either doesn't know what they're doing, is in is borderline insolvent when it comes to this size of a bond, doesn't regularly post bonds in New York. Let's see what happens. What could go wrong? And so we, you and I methodically went through the paperwork that was, that was first, it wasn't filed. They, they, they failed to properly upload a, the fundamental thing that a surety has to give is their financials. And, they, they le- and now we know why they left it out. And then the clerk was like, mm, uh, "Rejected. You need to upload your financials. You know, go check, go check our our statute book." Then they uploaded the financials, and we were like, "Oh, now we know why they didn't want to post them." The subsidiary that's posting the bond, Knight Specialty Insurance Company, a subsidiary of another company owned by Don Hankey, it doesn't have enough money for this bond. It has to be some sort of relationship between it and its parent company that would give it enough money. That's where, oh, we've got half a billion dollars and another couple of billion dollars. Yeah, that's like Don Hankey's different piggy banks, but they're not, at least on paper, they're not the money that is in the control of this actual excess insurer that's the bonding company. All right, that, so we got that problem. Then they said, well, don't worry, we've got a, a Schwab account or whatever it was for, and, for the amount of the bond or more. And then we looked at the paperwork related to that, and it was, well, you don't really have it. And yes, he, but he, but like you said, Ben, he has two days to to do monkey business. So that doesn't give. Remember, we're trying to give the judgment creditor. We keep forgetting there's a judgment creditor here, the people of the state of New York by Letitia James, who has a four hundred sixty five million dollar judgment. They're entitled to security, or they're allowed to collect. Now, and Goran, having heard all of this and all the new briefing that you just said that the uh, the attorney general had uh, sent in, and we know Angoran's already judged Donald Trump to be a liar under oath in court that can't be trusted and a, and a serial gag order violator and a serial misogynist on top of it attacking his wife and his principal law clerk. That judge, Angoran. The one that already sat through 13 weeks and found that he and convi- and, and adjudged him to be, along with his company and his kids, and every, a, a serial, con- persistent fraudster in the state of New York for over the last 10 years. That guy is now looking at whether there is fraud or at least misstatements in the financial condition of the bonding company that Donald Trump found. All right, here's what's going to happen. He's going to reject this bond. <laughs> He's going to say the bond is not valid. Whether he gives him additional time, I don't know, but he's going to reject the bond, which means at that moment, until the appellate court said something else, Letitia James would be able to go out to enforce her judgment. But we got the appellate court, which is the same appellate division you and I have talked about at length that sits over civil and criminal courts in New York. We've got them who issued the original um, stay as long as two things happen. One, a proper bond was posted. And two, the um, uh, the uh, appellate record was properly submitted by by Trump in June, which he still has time on the clock left for that. So if Angoron Angoron uh, blasts the bond out of existence, then Donald Trump will take an immediate emergency appeal to the appellate division. He'll walk in. We've we have a hot take up right now. I mean, New York is is very. Uh, easy to take emergency applications to the appellate court. We used to rip it off of a form book. We used to call them Bloomberg forms. 
we'd rip them off and it'd be like a pink, a yellow, and a, and a white. And this is what, now we do an electronic version. It's like three lines, uh, repealing, Judge and Goron's rejection of the bond and the state collect enforcement collection. And, and then they'll get a duty judge. They'll get an, an emergency judge that day. So it could be like we could be doing a lot of reporting on Monday, early Tuesday about this bond as he if he gets the on the wrong side of Angoron running off to appellate court again for another emergency appeal and application. He should have his own window at the appellate court. Like just 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 say like plaintiff, defend appellate uh, Trump, because he's he's wearing out a path. You know, he's at like 12 appeals on his various cases in two different courtrooms um, right at the appellate division. So I think to sum it up, rejection of the bond after a full evidentiary hearing, Trump's on the wrong side, emergency application again to the appellate division. And we'll have to see what they do, whether they cut him yet another break where they just say, nope, you had one chance. You told, we told you to post the bond. You can you can go collect on your your uh, your 465 million judgment, which means go suck money out of bank accounts, Schwab accounts, uh, everything. Uh, start selling property and the rest to collect the 465. It would be interesting to see if Donald Trump goes to the appellate division if New York Attorney General Letitia James then counters and says that they should reconsider even the reduction and make it be 464 based on the fact that Donald Trump lied. I mean potentially open the, uh, the the door to that. And New York Attorney General Letitia James filing, she says, um, she says that if uh, once the bond is denied, give Trump seven days to post, and then there'll be a collection. So she's requesting that happen in, um, in, in seven days from the order from Ngoron for her to go and, um, okay, and, good. See, and, and, and seize assets. Popak, I want to switch gears, though, and talk about the Supreme Court oral argument. Um, this is um, really a critical oral argument, um, and it's regarding the case Fisher versus United States. Fisher was a violent insurrectionist who was found uh, criminally responsible for a number of crimes, including 18 U.S.C. Section 1512C, which had been one of the more potent tools used by the Department of Justice to prosecute insurrectionists. And the question as framed by the United States Supreme Court was whether the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit erred, made a mistake in construing 18 U.S.C. Section 1512C, which prohibits obstruction of congressional inquiries and investigation to include acts unrelated to investigations and evidence. When the Supreme Court kind of even frames the question, like that, um, you can tell that I think they're inclined to feel a certain way that the D.C. Circuit may have erred, even though I don't think that's the case. But two of the charges against Donald Trump, in addition to this being a charge that um, you know it's a, carries within a 20-year sentence, many of the insurrectionists have been sentenced based on this. Um, but if you go to the statute, I'm sorry, two of the charges for Donald Trump have are under 18 U.S.C. Section 1512. And here's what it says. Whoever corruptly alters, destroys, mutilates, or conceals a record document or other object or attempts to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in an official proceeding or to otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. So the Department of Justice is saying, look, take a look at the statute, go to 18 U.S.C. section 1512C, and if you look at sub 2, otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so, that's a catch-all, and clearly the insurrectionist engaged in obstructive conduct to impede an official proceeding, which was the counting of the electoral votes. The argument by the insurrectionists is that no, subsection two is connected to subsection one. And when you look at the language otherwise obstructs influences, the word otherwise refers to otherwise altering, destroying, mutilating, or concealing a record so that they're attached and that unless the underlying conduct involves destruction, mutilation, or concealing of a record, like when the statute was first passed in response to Enron document shredding, 
then it doesn't apply. Popak, I want to get your take on it, but I've seen a lot of legal commentators uh, say this, and, and this is kind of where I agree with them, which is even if the Supreme Court um, finds that uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 1512C doesn't apply to a lot of the insurrectionists, the charge would still seem to me, at least, to still apply to Donald Trump because his conduct um, was document-based, evidence-based, submitting fake elector votes. And so to me, the statute still applies to him. What it wouldn't apply to potentially is the insurrectionist who just storms the building, who has nothing to do with the document, but Trump was manipulating documents. Now it still causes delay and there'll be motion practice if the Supreme Court uh, ultimately says that 18 U.S.C. 1512 doesn't apply. But you were watching the oral argument. You've done a hot take on it. What do you think the Supreme Court does and how do you think it impacts the insurrectionist cases and the Trump case? Well, let me start with the Trump case. The, the, even, even if the four or five right wing, as it looks like, Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch are definitely not going to vote for having this statute which came out of the 2002 Enron scandal, apply to the Jan 6 defendants who attacked the Capitol to stop the official proceeding, in this case, the congressional count of the electoral certificates, because um, they're going to tie the two subsections of the, of the statute together tightly and say that the otherwise impairs and impedes has to be something similar to the destruction in, uh, of, of documents or evidence. That's how, the, that's how the statute got on the books originally. Arthur Anderson, a now defunct for good reason, um, auditing and accounting firm, working with Enron, their client, they were like shredding and and uh, deleting and destroying and spoliating documents in, to impede a government investigation as to what, how the how Enron collapsed, which, which was sort of the FTX of its day, uh, sort of FTX and Madoff combined was was Enron, and that was the obstruction. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it only it only applies in exactly the same types of scenarios. I mean, the racketeering influence and corrupt organization statute RICO, including the one in Georgia was supposed to be to combat organized crime, primarily the mafia. We use it for lots of different things now, having nothing to do with organized crime. So it's okay, that's okay. So those guys, Gorsuch, Alito, Thomas, no, they're, not, they're not going to vote for that. They're going to vote to overturn the District, uh, the, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and its decision, led by Judge Pan again, who is becoming quickly becoming, even though she's a new just the judge there, quickly becoming quite a star on the DC Court of Appeals. Um, Roberts was sort of um, you could see him like his wheels were turning and the smoke was coming out of his ears about it. He, I think he finally got right with the solicitor generals uh, for the United States' position that you, if you read them together, it's not a dragnet, that the catch-all is not a dragnet to catch all bad conduct. It was specifically drafted in a way that there is obviously other things that the the, the Congress was concerned about that they couldn't enumerate particularly, but they wanted to criminalize about uh, interference impeding an official proceeding. And rather than try to sit down and cogitate about a list of things that goes a mile long of everything you possibly could do and, and anticipate it, you just put a catch all in. I think he got right with that. Certainly Kagan, who led the charge for the left side, the Democratic side of the Supreme Court in her questioning is going to be joined on on upholding the statute's application to those Jan 6 defendants, along with uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson and Sotomayor. Um, Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett were kind of quiet. And uh, so I, don't, I think it's 4-4. And the question is, where's Roberts going to be? Even if they were to strip this charge away from 350 Jan 6 defendants. Think about the floodgates there. There's been 2,500 or so Jan 6 defendants. 350 of them had this charge against them, some of which have already been convicted, some of which have already been convicted and served their sentences. It's been so long. So they're, the, the ones that are going to serve their sentences, they're going to have their sentences vacated and you know expunged and all of that those that are waiting trial will have it stripped away from their indictment if it's the only part of their indictment they'll be 
they'll be released. Um, and so that's all of that. Now, some people were, are worried, were worried because two of the four counts against Donald Trump, who is the sole defendant in the D.C. election interference case before Judge Chutkin, are for this very same 18 U.S.C. 1512. But um, the credit, of course, goes to Jack Smith, who already anticipated he knows what's up at the court's docket. And he knew when he filed his immunity brief for the oral argument on the 25th of April that he better address that. And he said, even if this court were to, for instance, uh, dis, uh, find that 1512 doesn't apply to the Jan 6 defendants in the Fisher case, it doesn't do a darn thing uh, to the two counts against Donald Trump, because even if you were to find that it requires some sort of mutilation, destruction, or a, a drowning and strangling of documents, we have that with Donald Trump in the fake elector certificates. And so since he tried to use the fake elector certificates as a substitute for the real election uh, elector certificates, uh, uh, that is, even under any interpretation of 1512, that would fall under 1512C1, uh, not 2, or 1, not 2, and therefore it, it nothing should happen. Now, having said all of that, if if, if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Joe Fisher, this former Pennsylvania cop who, who uh, put on his social media things like, a dead congressperson can't certify. One who's not breathing can't can't uh, you know obviously one intending to interfere with the uh, official proceeding. If if they find for Joe Fisher and therefore psh, open up the vaults and let all these people out, then Donald Trump, when that case restarts, assuming immunity goes against Donald Trump, and which we think it will, and the Department of Justice is back up and running in the Chutkin case. When she reconvenes the uh, the parties after she gets the mandate from the Supreme Court late May, early June, before they go away on summer vacation, uh, sh the first thing that you know they're going to do is they're going to say, we're going to file a motion to dismiss the two aspects of the indictment based on the recent Supreme Court ruling. She'll have it briefed. She'll have to make a fast decision. It will go up to the Supreme Court. And unless, and unless Jack Smith wants to pull the pin, the linchpin, and just and just cut those two out and just try the case on a conspiracy for election interference, he's going to have to wait until those two counts wend its way through yet another appellate process. And there we go. We don't have, see, I'm not hopium today. We don't have a DC election interference case before the November 5th election because of this development. So I agree it ultimately survives, but it'll have to go through a process which will take time that we frankly don't have. Pessimism, Popey. He went from hopia Popey to pe no, I'm just joking. I mean, there, there, there's actually, I think, a lot to be optimistic about right now with law and order and what we're watching uh, take place in Manhattan. And again, not because I don't like Donald Trump or this or that. It's that I care about law and order and watching Donald Trump's attacks to our system be neutralized by the system and have a fair and impartial jury be selected swiftly, opening statements, have the system do what the system's supposed to do. Is it an imperfect system? Yes, but it is one worth preserving and one worth um, protecting. That finally brings us, and this is only a, a brief update that we'll have here, federal judge Eileen Cannon uh, denying the a motion to dismiss the indictment and for a bill of particulars that were filed by Donald Trump's co-defendants, Waltine Nauta and Carlos de Oliveira in the Mar-a-Lago document case where Donald Trump uh, stole national defense information, including nuclear secrets and war plans, and claims it's his personal property now just because, he says, under the Presidential Records Act, which is a civil statute, not a criminal statute, that says the opposite of what Trump says. He claims that he can take it. And uh, Waltine Nauta and De Oliveira were involved in the process of moving these boxes and documents and concealing evidence. They were charged with uh, the obstruction and making false statement charges uh, in the indictment. And look, Judge Eileen Cannon goes out of her way to make it clear that her job as a judge is to simply look at the allegations in the indictment 
and not look outside of the indictment. She makes some, you know, somewhat kind of snobby remarks in there um, to kind of imply, we'll see what the jury does. We'll see what happens at a later stage. But she's, I'm bound by the four corners and the four corners of the indictment says this and that asserts the elements of the crime. And, you know, she just doesn't want to get reversed by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals at this point. She doesn't really know what she's doing right now because she still hasn't set a trial date, right? We're recording this on April 20th, if you're watching this after the live, just for reference. And as of, remember, March 1, she held that status conference where she was going to set a trial date. And special counsel Jack Smith said, look, you didn't set basic deadlines like I told you to, like SEPA Section 5 hearings and other stuff that you would normally do in a classified information procedures act case. So we think July makes sense. Obviously, you can't make the May trial date. Then Donald Trump said, yeah, we think never. Um, how, how is never? Uh, like we never do the trial. Or maybe like late 25, 2026. And she said at the March 1st hearing that she thought that Jack Smith's July date was too soon. She was more inclined to push this thing out into 2025. But here we are, April 20th now, after a March 1st hearing, she hasn't changed the trial date. And so the parties have to proceed as if this May 20th trial date is still the trial date. And so I'm not sure what she's trying to pull there. It's very odd. It's, you know, she's definitely trying to pull something. Um, we'll just say that. I'm not sure she's kind of figured it out and thought through it, but the parties are going to have to submit their pre-trial stuff soon unless she moves the date and deadline, which she has yet to do. So that's my update on it, Michael Popak. Anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, not, not much more other than with another example of co-conspirators for Donald Trump definitely going to trial and or jail while Donald Trump, at least because of Judge Cannon, we still sit on tender hooks about whether that's going to happen or not. You know, Peter Navarro's cooling his heels in jail. Alan Weisselberg is in jail for a second time. Um, Walt Nauda and Carlos D. And I get criticisms about how I pronounce his last name, but I don't care. Carlos D. Oliveira are going to trial because their, their indictment dismissal motion papers, as you outlined, have been rejected. Um, the question is, is Donald Trump going to be joining them on this trial when it happens? And why these two, the, the butler and the maintenance worker, are continued to be committed to Donald Trump and are willing to go over the precipice and go over the cliff uh, for Donald Trump is still is still beyond me. I, I get, I mean, the butler and, and or Carl, Carlos and or Walt should have already cut a deal with the government and made this a standalone case against Donald Trump with those two um, uh, testifying against them. And we, we've already outlined that at least one of them has a MAGA paid for lawyer, which would help explain why they're not thinking that clearly. I mean, every time somebody has gotten their own counsel that has independent judgment not being paid for by Donald Trump or his PAC, they seem to make the right decision, like the Yusil Tavares, the IT worker, who could have easily been the third co-defendant with Donald Trump, but thought better of it after he fired his lawyer and hired a um, a, um, a, a, it was a, uh, a legal defense. I think they gave it to him. I think it was a, um, he didn't even have a private counsel for that one. I think he used, he used the public defender for it, a federal public defender and then said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to testify against Donald Trump now. <laughs> so that's how we learned about the videotapes and the attempt to try to, uh, to uh, drown it and bury it, and burn it, and do everything else to the, yep. to the videotapes as possible. So that's still, I mean, I, I just want to do like a running commentary here at the bottom. I'm still shocked that Walt Nauda has not succumbed to the pressure of like facing a number of years in a federal penitentiary and hasn't already turned on. Yes, I know he still works for the guy, but you know, he's got to, he's got to see the writing on the wall. If he, there was another judge there and it was Chutkin, or if it was any other judge in the Southern District of Florida, I think it would have changed their minds. But because, you know, the strategy of Trump to, um, you know, it looks like there's, what's the old joke about um, when, when it looks like the referees in a sporting event are on the side of one of the teams, there's too many men on the field. I mean, it, it always looks like there's, whenever she makes a decision, except where she has to, absolutely has to, she makes a decision and it looks like it benefits Donald Trump. Like even in the motion to dismiss, that she had to grant, uh, she had to deny both both the motion for bill of particulars for more yeah. 
information about um, the charges against the Oliveira, uh, uh, including about him lying to the FBI and and to Nauda. The four corners of the indictment, which have to be accepted as true for the purposes of the motion, clearly met the standard for pleadings. And this is also from two years ago. And but even there, she I don't know if you saw it, Ben. I'm sure you did. She started to get Cannon started to get like wobbly at one point about the word. Listen, listen to this one. The word corrupt and what is its meaning in a criminal federal statute, including the one that we've been talking about at length here. Let me make it easy for our I'll do a little breakout Patreon session right here. OK, I will I will concede for a moment that when Congress and different Congresses over time make criminal law, they are not consistent with their vocabulary. I'll give you that. And they're not consistent sometimes with terms of art. And they're not, it's not AI doing it, it's human beings. And sometimes they make um, things that inadvertently create ambiguity because, well, they use knowingly in that statute, but they use willfully in this statute, but they use corruptly in that statute. Are they the same? Are they the different? And then it's left to lawyers like you and me and the, and the, and the court system and ultimately the, the appellate courts to figure out what these words mean. But there's already sort of a compendium, a thesaurus, a dictionary uh, of, of defined terms and corruptly Anybody that practices criminal law, we know what the word means, and we know what the appellate courts and the Supreme Court have said about the word. More importantly, we know what the 11th Circuit, which is Aileen Cannon's boss, has said about how do you interpret the word corruptly. So for her to spill ink over you know, half of her order to say, he raises a very good point, Mr. Nauda, about the word corruptly and in, in how it's being used in 1512C. There it does seem to be some inconsistencies. And then at the end she says, but then the 11th Circuit's defined corruptly, so I have to follow that. So why go off? In, I was like, oh, here we go. Right. Why, right? why go off into the wilderness of her own making about you know, cogitating about what the word corruptly means when it's one of the most better defined terms in criminal statutory construction. Go go look at go look up Scalia and Gardner on how to interpret words if you don't know how to do it. That's what everybody points to. So again, as as you said, even when she's forced to do yep. the right thing, she finds a way to be canon. Popak couldn't agree with you more. Covered a lot of topics today. Remember, everybody, now would be the time to sign up. Patreon.com slash Legal AF. Let's get to 3,000 students in under 30 days. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Legal AF. Thank you to our pro-democracy sponsors. I hope you all enjoy the new Justice Mershon emoji. I hope you've been enjoying our continuing coverage here about the Trump criminal trial every morning and after the trial. Make sure you check in uh, here on the Midas Touch Network to get those updates from Karen Friedman, Agnifilo, and I. And of course, Popak will be doing hot takes throughout the day as well. Thank you all, Legal AFers. We appreciate you so, so much. We'll be here with you every step of the way in this Trump criminal trial, and we'll be with you every step of the way thereafter. Thanks for watching. Shout out to the Legal AFers. Shout out to the Midas Mighty. Heary, heary. Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF exclusive content you won't find anywhere else all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee join us at patreon.com slash legal af that's patreon.com